Thank you to Alliance Atlantis Communications Inc. and RBC Financial Group for sponsoring today's students' tables. And now I'd like to turn on the Liberated Learning software as I introduce today's special guest. Testing. Okay, if, if the audience starts laughing, I know that it's not picking up what I'm saying. Our speaker today is President and CEO of a Canadian-based global telecommunications innovator and leader, Nortel. Few industries have gone through such exciting times and challenging times as the telecommunications industry has over the past number of years. Just walk into any consumer electronics store or watch a group of teenagers using pages and cell phones in ways that many of us can barely understand. And you have evidence of the unrelenting revolution in telecommunications. Consumer trends are changing and evolving constantly. Technologies are keeping pace with those trends and driving them. Pushing communications products and services that had been hot and new into early obsolescence. And competition is complex and ever-changing in this converging telecommunications world. Who would have ever predicted as recently as five years ago that Apple would become one of the largest music distribution companies in the world? Telecommunications is an industry in which the convergence of content and media is resulting in remarkable innovations that are making people's lives easier. Already, consumers can make home videos with their mobile telephones watch TV shows on their laptop computers, and surf the internet on their television sets. Today we will learn how Nortel is competing to win in this business environment, with passion, with a focus on delivering results, and with the highest standards of ethics. I'm looking forward to hearing from Mike Zafarovsky to gain fresh insights into the world of telecommunications, and to learn about strategies and approaches that can be applied to any industry or sector. A bit of background on Mike Zafarovsky. Before joining Nortel in November 2005, he was a senior executive at Motorola. He also worked for 25 years at General Electric, 13 of which he spent as president and CEO of five separate businesses in the industrial, financial services, and insurance sectors. So by his early 30s, Mike Zafarovsky was already a president and CEO within one of the world's most respected corporations. He holds a BA in mathematics from Edinburgh University in Pennsylvania, where he was captain of the intercollegiate soccer and swimming teams. His alma mater also awarded him an honorary doctorate in 2002. A native of Macedonia, Mike and his wife Robin have three sons. And Robin and Mike serve as the national chairs of Duke University's Parents Committee. Mike Zafarovsky will be speaking to us today about how the passionate, relentless pursuit of superior results and doing the right thing are central to the leadership philosophy that Nortel is, is using to transform its business and to thrive in its markets. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the President and CEO of Nortel, Mr. Mike Zafarovsky. Good afternoon. I'm just watching to make sure that, that the inspired technology is not trying to follow my speech. But uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. I'm great to see customers, partners, a board member, as well as so the, certainly the expectations uh, coming in here this morning have just risen a few notches of a um, few degrees. But it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon. Noel, thank you for the very kind introduction and thanks to them liberated learning for a very inspired application of technology. Uh, you've asked me to speak about global leadership. And I've looked at quotes and thought maybe you can try to use two examples of quotes and you can determine which one of those proved to be correct and incorrect. It will not be a hard quiz, I promise. The first one is from 1977, a CEO of a very advanced uh, technology company asked a question why he said there's no reason for anyone to have a computer in their home. He, of course, was Ken Olson from digital and so sometimes it's a, a wrong strategy along with a wrong execution can prove to be very, very 
poor results for that company. Next one is from a sports figure. This is from a Canadian hockey player to say, move where the puck will be. Don't wait for it. And obviously, combination of great strategy, skills, and also living to that, to that um, uh, very simple goals. He was able to excite fans from all over the world. And I love and admire leadership. I mean, ever since uh, school, I have followed leadership on a political, military, uh, historical figures, and, of course, sports and business. My two favorite uh, topics um, today. So I've studied over the years. I've been very fortunate in my professional experiences to have been able to uh, to be able to have quite a few good experiences. So I'll try in the next uh, 20 minutes or so to provide a perspective on leadership, some of my philosophies on it, to discuss briefly the status of Northall Primus that's not been operating, or a strategic review, but to, to, to describe um, briefly where we see Northall today and how we see the future. And also a few comments on the industry, the trends which we see in the industry, and why we think they'll be so positive for the Nortel's current assets. I also make a couple of comments on Canada's commitment to innovation and education, including Learn It, which I think is a very, very powerful tool that we will be using much more proactively on a going forward basis. But before Nortel, I worked for two other great companies, General Electric and Motorola. G, as you may not know, was actually started by Thomas Edison, the person that had, uh, to his name, more than 1,000 patents. But what G is best known, and I fully agree with that, is the company is always prepared to make significant investments in people. It has a reputation for growing terrific leaders. I've worked alongside some of the best leaders of our time, directly for Jack Walsh, Larry Bossidy, Jim McNerney, Dave Calhoun. Learned quite a few things from them. But the most important takeaway from my 25 years at General Electric was simply that how teamwork, alignment, and high expectations from both results and leadership values can produce extraordinary results from rather ordinary people in rather ordinary industries all over the world. I also have the privilege for being a five years at Motorola, again, another great um, innovation company. I learned there the value of innovation and a recommitment to quality. We well, used to hear at one point in time, they forgot it. And again, if you, uh, again, if you forget some of the basics which drives the business forward, the results will quickly follow. Also, a value of commitment to people and to ethics, in both the best of times and also in times are not as, uh, not as good. And the power of momentum in a business uh, when it's recovering from a, from a downturn. And, uh, but the most significant learning for my time at Nortel, really was managing a crisis in a turnaround. I joined Motorola in June of 2000. I was right at the height of the telecom boom. And within two months afterwards, I mean, the, the floor gave out. This is a, so we could do a massive downsizing actions, which we never thought we would had to do, and really challenged most of the principles, on one hand, the commitment to people, to environment, and what I like to I mean, to people and to, uh, and to um, uh, really test it, or the principles which I believed coming into 2000 are appropriate. And your question may be, well, what are those principles that, that, uh, that you had coming to Motorola? And preparing for this session is a, you know, I was going to simply highlight the, the six principles which I've tried to follow now for almost exactly 20 years. It was back in September 1986, unexpectedly you get a phone call, and you're given the responsibility, the privilege, to actually lead a business, not a big business, but probably the president and CEO of a business within uh, General Electric. And there was a town hall meeting, probably the size of this room, five or 600 people, they were expecting to hear from the new president, what are you all about? So I worked very diligently what I believed in business, and what commitments I can make to that group, with a proviso up front, if I ever deviate from those commitments, call me, write me an email, <laughs> I guess there's no email, but write me a letter, uh, remind me, and to, again, the, 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 the really perspective was to drive the company forward. In the six principles, which I've outlined, and, and this is nothing profound here. If you want to lose weight, and you exercise more, and you eat less. The business, I, I, I think it's very similar. And those six things which I wrote back in September of 1986 were, number one, to delight customers. I mean, the commitment was to spend at least half my time with customers and the people serving the customers of the sales force. Second, which I thought was very important, is to provide for a very motivating and challenging environment. 
if people really you know, believe they can reach all their aspirations. Number three, to deliver superior financial results. It's a litmus test if you're a successful business or not. You have a firm belief if you do a great job in number one and number two, three should be a natural outcome. Four, to give back to communities. I think all successful companies have an obligation to give uh, to, uh, to give to the communities. At the same time, makes you magnet for employees, to people who want to come and work for your company. Five, to compete. I love to compete. If you put all the efforts behind competition, you may as well expect to win. <clears throat> if you don't win, see the first time, try again, try again. At the end, you may want have to pick a different sport, different game, different business. I think there was an expectation to provide to those employees back 20 years ago. And last, and I, I would argue most important, is to, is to demonstrate the leadership values within that company. It's very important for people, not only the top person, but for general management of the organization, for all the managers to really embody the leadership values which are communicated as being important to that organization. I can walk you through the leadership values of General Electric, those four E's. Personal energy, ability to energize others, edge, the, 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 the courage to make the tough calls promptly and execute. And Motorola, they're some, somewhat different. Motorola is using best practices, including things from General Electric. They have four E's plus always one E. They change the personal energy to envision, which I thought is very appropriate. And if you're a high-tech company, you need to see what's around the corner. And also, they added always one E, which is always with ethics. So back in 2000, we were somewhat criticized with the challenges that Motorola was having. Why was it possible? Why was it important for us to have ethics as being as important as the other four? And I think it's very relevant to, if you reflect back on the last five or six years, how they very much was the right decision to make. So the first thing which we actually did at Nortel, the first staff meeting, we looked at the employee satisfaction surveys, we looked at our performance, we said, look, we need to raise the bar of how we perform as a management team. Make a commitment to our customers, to our suppliers, to the board, but most importantly, to the employees, that this is what we're going to represent. And again, if, we, if we're not behaving that way, there will be consequences. And most of the time, looking for the positive consequences. So promotions, rewards are based on people living up to those values. And we came up with six of them. Uh, the first one is that for every Nortel leader to chart a winning course. Whatever your job is, and you explain to your employees the winning strategy which you have for that group. Number two, to be decisive. Number three, to inspire your employees. Number four, to meet commitments. Number five, to live the Nortel values. Exude and command integrity is number one in Nortel values. And to act as one. You cannot have fifths, you cannot have silos. Nortel always comes at the top of their list. The tagline for those six values is to have a passionate, relentless pursuit of superior results and doing the right thing. And if you look at what our performance the last number of years, obviously we have our work to do on well, many of those, but there's the commitment, there's the passion, and, if I, and I, I would urge you, for you as you speak with um, people that, uh, that may be working at Nortel, including people that are here this afternoon, that we're really changing the company starting with the leadership values. And, uh, and it is number one, to be able to increase the confidence of the employees, both the engagement team, but also in their belief that they will be able to succeed based on a pretty much described leadership values once we, we will have a full support of the organization. So the follow-up question may be, well, why Nortel? Why did you make this decision almost a year ago uh, this time? And I had a number of opportunities. The thing that excited me most about Nortel is the opportunity to take a company, a heavy great company, iconic in many cases, to take the best of that company and to quickly address the issues facing it. So I did not come here naive. I was very much aware of, uh, of, of the challenges facing us, including some people may argue there's a perfect storm that was facing Nortel over the last number of years. On one hand, was the downturn of the industry, also the class actions, the restatements, the financial performance, and a cost structure still not competitive uh, despite the very significant downsizing. And also some of the processes, which again, anytime you downsize it significantly, as North Carolina had to do, some of the processes would suffer. So this was the challenge facing uh, the company, but also a company with absolutely terrific assets. 
Let me out start with number one, a more than a century history of innovation. Many of the first in communication, the digital world, the optical world actually came out of Nortel. Also a listing of customers that second to none. Customers that really want Nortel to be successful. Now I would say coupled with that is the commitment in the, the DNA of the company that knows how to partner with customers. And sometimes you have to teach people what's most important. That's within the DNA. We know how to both build, complete new systems. At the same time, if there's a problem, our employees are not confused. They know serving the customer is is number one. World-class intellectual property. We have 5,500 patents. With experience in building networks and applications, both for enterprises and for, uh, and for carriers. And our people, 3,000 plus strong, and also 12,000 professional and seasoned R&D professionals. So again, this is a, a platform which I found to be very, very attractive. And the issues are not insignificant, but I would argue that issues are much easier to fix, mostly internal, and the assets would be very, very hard to replicate. So, so in, in, in essence, that is a challenge which we have, uh, to optimize the assets and very quickly attack the issues, and that's, what, frankly, what we're doing. The second reason for joining Nortel is this industry. And yes, it's not easy, but it's not easy because the best companies in the world want to be, want to be in this industry. The industry really changes how we operate, how we work, how we communicate, entertainment. So this, I would argue, is the most exciting industry in the world. And there are some real examples of how we, working with our customers, make a real difference in many communities. I'll take one example here, our, our work with Bell Canada to rejuvenate the northern Ontario economy of Chaplau. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Uh, and this is by providing state-of-the-art wireless and optical infrastructure that's attracted commerce really positioning the, and the, the town as a very desirable um, tourist destination. Also, we work closely with Natago and the Alberta Specialty Areas Board to bridge the digital divide. We actually combine forces to provide affordable wireless broadband access both for consumers as well as for the businesses and who previously did not have those capabilities. So this is some of the reasons for behind uh, joining Nortel. You may be interested to order the planes for the company. And I can just say in no uncertain terms, I mean, we are committed with passion, resolve, and a political confidence to recreate a great company. We have a number of very specific short-term priorities under the umbrella of big. These things for business transformation, improve our profitability and change our processes. I stands for integrity renewal. It be very important from the, our recent history. We want to be a best practice. If a company ever gets in trouble to look at what Nortel's board and management team really have done in this, in this past three years. And I really would challenge discussion with the SEC and the OSC to be very clear that the uh, openness, the transparency, the cooperation, and the actions taken in the plans which we have ahead uh, for, for us to really have this to become a best practice is well underway. And this is not a lip service to the annual report letter or speech in, uh, in Toronto, but this is how we truly, truly want to transform the company to be the most modern and contemporary in corporate governance and to have a set of integrity and policies that are both true, not only the letter, but also the spirit of those uh, guidelines. And lastly, growth initiatives. I mean, I understand this is all about growth. We're making commitments of increasing our sales and marketing efforts to drive our enterprise business, investments of WiMAX, video, and so again, I will not make this a, um, a operational review, that we're putting resources behind all three of the short-term activities, and I'm very, very confident the results will, will, will start showing up uh, well before 2006 is over. We also have a short, we also have a long-term plan for the company. I've said it's going to take a number of years to truly recreate a great company, and I will only make a comment on the first one. We have a world-class leadership team and processes for people and for the work culture. And I'm thrilled with the team which we've put together. I mean, I believe it's a world-class team. With both promotions and people that have spent their whole careers with, uh, with Nortel, been able to attract what I believe is a world-class individuals, people with the right uh, values, and also a history, of, a history of accomplishment. So, so this includes people from careers with Nortel, but also IBM, PC, GE, Motorola, RBC, Juniper, Broadcom, 
they were really betting their careers and the reputations that the work that's being done at Nortel will in fact create a great new Nortel. Also to incorporate a few things with employee engagement. And employee satisfaction is just as important for us as uh, improving uh, cash flow and operating margins. And Own It is a program to really have all 30,000 plus employees feel as owners uh, of the company. So again, I can go on for a long time, but I can assure you there's lots of passion behind both short-term commitments and a long-term uh, building of a company. And this industry is in a continual evolution. Uh, and we have a great new chief technology officer. His name is John Rose. I mean, he's a CTO of a Fortune 500 company at age 26. Now he's an aged and seasoned 36 years old. But he talks about the eras that technologies go through, especially on, on connections net and networking. And he describes the time from 1990 to 1995 as a, as a time. There's the technology wars. What is the best way to connect? So at the end of that era, there's quite a few, uh, if you will, winners or losers. The winners were, among others, Ethernet, packet networks, and IP. So those are decisions that were made. And for the next five years, from 1996 to 2000, we saw a great build out of networks. More effective, uh, more uh, bigger, faster, cheaper. And for the last five or six years, from 2001 to 2006, we have seen the industry has been focused on making the infrastructure and applications uh, more intelligence and starting to really see the, uh, the opportunities in mobility and convergence. You know, many applications have been candidates among the most advanced countries in the world in terms of application, but we really see a whole new era ahead of us. I'll just very quickly touch on the three things which are developing. They're going to really accelerate over the next five or six years and try to, to summarize why we believe with many of the assets, the know-hows, and, um, and, and the passion to use these transformations in trends to, uh, to, to, to restore North Delhi to a place of a prominence. Uh, those three things is number one, to address the hyper-connectivity. I mean, increasingly we're seeing thousands of IP-enabled devices. I mean, the Blackberries, cell phones, laptops, IP-enabled smart buildings, and this list will keep increasing. Your home, your car, your gaming systems, so this list will continue to explode, and we're going to see more and more of a video applications driving it to a whole new era of capabilities from application perspective, but also requirements from networks. Um, and of course, this will require new security technologies, new quality technologies, new network discovery capabilities, and new tr uh, transport capabilities as well. This is all going to have to work seamlessly across a huge ecosystem of devices and networks. The second major trend is reinventing applications. We had great progress in the last five, last ten years, but now with, with web services and SOA, systems um, oriented architecture, we're moving from a world where the applications were developed for really one size fits all, whoops, independent of the awareness of the communication systems around them or the specific requirements in the consumers or the businesses. And we really see this changing dramatically. One example is if you can just think how the web page today is really personalized to your business. You see all those applications being very similar to the expectations that consumers are going to have on a prospective basis. The last one is true broadband. I mean, going forward, people will not accept the fact that there is a difference between their mobile and their fixed devices, their home networks, or their business networks. They, they will demand a true broadband experience no matter where they are. There's some real uh, positive trends right now in places like Korea and Japan. We think that, that this, this will be uh, accelerating in, a, in, a, in, a, in the Western world very, very fast. And by the way, the developing world is not necessarily 10, 15 years behind. Some of the most innovative uh, applications right now in places like Russia. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different time for a different presentation. So can I portray a picture now, as opposed to a perfect storm where Nortel was uh, four or five years ago, are the stars really aligning behind us with a trend which I briefly described, do they play to our competences and our capabilities? I'll just make a couple, um, a couple of questions, and at least in the first three, I'll give you in advance the answer is, uh, the, the, it's, it's absolutely yes for us, and the fourth one, where we have made great strides in the last, in the last 12 months. 
Uh, first, to win in the new area, do you need a leadership in the carrier and enterprise worlds? So IT and tele IT in, um, and telecom and converging, the answer is absolutely, will play a very important role in both of those spaces. Second, a deep understanding of both applications and infrastructure. Again, very much plays to our strengths. With the technologists in this room, they know that many innovations, which Norto started on, uh, on set basis, uh, such an initiative protocol. Uh, number three, leadership in both wireline and wireless technologies. They're converging. We have a good position in both of those. And the last one, ability to lead an ecosystem of this knowledge and the right partners and alliances. I said, this is the one to do. But great progress, great uh, changing now our perceptions of how we work with uh, partners. A couple of examples, the joint venture, which we signed with LG the Electronics in December of last year. The Microsoft Alliance, they're very innovative. As opposed to playing defense, we are moving forward. And partnerships with companies like IBM. Combined go-to-market resources, you can see many more of those in the coming, in, in the coming months. And I really do believe that time is right now for us to assume the leadership position again. I'm going to wrap up with a couple comments on my perspective of technology leadership in Canada and a few comments on education. Uh, as I was going to the airport last Friday, and I saw a great um, headline story. Blueprint for, uh, a blueprint for greatness. This is in the in the record. I did not real. I did not see this newspaper before. It was a uh, odd um, event, uh, but I loved it. And this is a um, the Dr. Um, David Johnson, the president of the University of Waterloo, is communicating. Uh, he ten steps. What, what it would it take to have Northern Ontario to become the communications uh, knowledge um, capital? of Canada. And we have a long and rich history with the, with the University of Waterloo. It was, it was in a low, low basis for the last couple of years. I was thrilled to go there a couple of months ago to give a chair uh, for, the, for the wireless communications for next generation technology. So anyway, if you don't have a chance, you should read that. There's a new Canadian. Um, the article struck a note with me, including a, a, a quote. This is the story of Canada. It is coming from a very little and making much of it. So you're thinking back on what Canada and companies have been able to do, starting with BNR, one of the most advanced, most accomplished technology labs in the world. Of course, Nortel. I made some of the comments on, uh, on Bell Canada. But also, you look at some of our customers and other companies. What TELUS is doing, for example, in wireless leadership, as well as uh, some of their uh, plans for IPTV. Rogers. I mean, from the pioneering the AC radio in 1925 to the, today's delivery of home phone uh, voice over cable telephony. The revolution of personal communications that REM has been conducting. I'm mean, so impressed with what they, they have been able to do. And again, this is a you know, individuals with passion and close association with the great university been able to really change the way business is being conducted. So I can go on for a long time, but Canadian innovators have really a prominent role in the business world today. They're making our businesses more competitive. Governments much more effective. You know, it's always like to complain about governments, but actually the Canadian government is by far the most e-centric in the world. And of course, driving technology to further improve education. I really see a good opportunity for businesses, governments, and uh, universities to work together, even more than we've done to this point in time. I've traveled extensively in, with all three companies right now, but there's really best practices in countries like Korea, Singapore, and Finland. So the cooperation between business and government and the universities is a level, frankly, greater than many other, uh, uh, than virtually any other country. So I look forward as North is getting healthier for us to become even more active participant working again with, with the other uh, companies, with the government, and with the universities to really drive Canada to a whole new level. This competition, i.e. other countries, are certainly not standing still. And let me just wrap up with a few comments on education, aspirations for our kids, the future leaders uh, of the world, and also for tools. I mean, you probably know that uh, today's uh, generation of teens has been called as the connectors or super connectors, excuse me. 
These young people don't view technology as technology, but they view technology simply as an extension of their voice and their ability to communicate on their terms. I have three sons, all of them are age 21, and I know what it is. Instant, personal, and always available. As all of you parents, and I know there's lots of parents in this room, know that um, these kids, uh, we have technology as part of their DNA. We have trouble engaging and learning without the right tools. We have a tremendous program at, uh, at Nortel which will be increasing our funding, part of our commitment to become a much more involved in our communities. It's called Learn It. And it helps bring this technology to more and more kids every day. It supplies educators in development of new and exciting ways to integrate the latest technologies to the teaching process to help connect students with the power of 21st century learning. It really helps prepare the innovators and leaders, our kids, people who run our countries, in the governments, and um, in the business in the future. So before the q and I, I will ask for this video to, um, to play. It's about two minutes. And again, it's great to be here. I look forward to our robust Q&A session. Thank you very much. Can we have the video, please? Hello. I'm a high school student in a typical technology classroom, which begs the question, what kind of curriculum do they teach in the class like this? And how do you train the teachers and students to get the maximum benefit out of it? I'd like to tell you about a nonprofit organization that addresses these needs. It's called Nortel Learnit, and it's important to Nortel community relations. Nortel Learnit helps teachers succeed using technology in our classroom. That's what I love about Nortel Learnit, it's because it's so user friendly, and you get right on there, and those tutorials are so explicit, and it shows you exactly how to navigate through the site so you can be successful, and your students can also look at those tutorials, and they're successful as well. The reason other schools will find Nortel Learning useful is it's free sharing of educational content from teachers and students to teachers and students. Um, can't beat that. Free and good. Nortel Learning is more than just teaching us technology, but more importantly, it shows us how to apply technology to all subjects. The spider quickly moves from link to link, searching for sites that match your search criteria. Let's go ahead and open Earthview. Ready to get PowerPointing? Nortel Learn It is about helping others apply technology to their everyday lives. I think Learn It, you know, affords such an incredible opportunity for students, whether they're in high school or college, to really practice the art of translating what is a complex topic area, right? But making it real, making it relevant, and frankly getting people jazzed about it because if they are, they'll embrace it, they'll take to it more. In my case, hopefully they'll buy more. But you know what? Nortel Learnit needs you. We need you to help others discover and use Nortel Learnit. Nortel Learnit really inspires me with technology. You can share it with your friends, and I'm pretty sure they'll like it too. I want to learn it! We need you to introduce Nortel Learnit to other students in your community. We need you to show how easy it is to use. But most of all, we need you to embrace Nortel Learn It as your offering to your community. Hopefully you enjoy that. The whole video is prepared proactively by kids in a um, high school out of Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. You know, as I said, uh, great to be here. I guess I'm formally supposed to be sitting down right now and see there's lots of questions. And I look forward to answering as many of those as possible. If there's any additional questions or suggestions, uh, my email is mikez at nortel.com. So it means uh, write to me and I'll, I'll try to respond to some, some additional ones. Thank you very much. Thank you.